Um, I rise to move Amendment 85 and to speak to the others in my name in the group. I am very grateful for the support of the Noble Lords, Lord Ponsonby and Lord German. Um, I should say at the outset that I am very grateful for the briefing and expertise provided to me by the organisation Women in Prison, and I declare my interest as Anglican Bishop for Her Majesty's Prisons. My Lords, at committee stage, I highlighted the injustice of punishing a child for their parents' mistakes, and I won't go over that ground again, but I do want to frame this discussion by reminding us that when a parent goes to prison, it can affect every area of a child's life, from losing their familiar home and school through to reduced educational achievement and mental and physical well-being, and the consequences can last a lifetime. It is also important to highlight again that the imprisonment of a household member is one of ten adverse childhood experiences known to have a significant negative impact on a child's long-term well-being, including life expectancy, and it raises the possibility of children being imprisoned themselves at some point in their lives. Although I do want to be very clear on that point, that there is nothing genet genetic about offending. If a child is failed by the system, left disenfranchised and excluded, we have failed them. We must do all we can to ensure children can reach their potential. In response to the government's uh, counter-arguments received at committee stage, I wish to make three points uh, tonight, knowing that other Lords will provide more detail. First, uh, pre-sentence reports. At committee, the noble lord, the minister said, and I quote, a request of the court to adjourn for a pre-sentence report when a primary care is a risk of custody is mandatory. However, as I understand it, the sentencer does not have to accede to that request, and a PSR will only be obtained if the sentencer requests it. So me, making it mandatory for probation to request a PSR still does not create an obligation on a sentencer to request one. Over the past decade, there's been a decline in PSR volumes and a shift from written to oral PSRs. There are three delivery methods of pre-sentence reports. Oral reports, fast delivery reports are both usually delivered on the same day as the court hearing by the court duty probation officer, while standard delivery reports require more detail and are delivered after an adjournment of up to 15 days in order to obtain additional information. A research and analysis bulletin from HM Inspectorate of Probation 2020 found that the recent shift towards oral PSRs, with a focus upon speed and timeliness, has had an impact on the quality of information provided to courts. In 2018-2019, 58% of reports were orally delivered rather than written, twice as many as in 2012-2013, whilst 39% were fast delivery reports and only 3% were standard delivery reports. Now, I am encouraged that between March and May 2021, a pilot commenced uh, between Ministry of Justice, HMCTS and the Probation Service of an alternative delivery model to increase the number of cases which receive pre-sentence reports from 53% to 75%. And I note that women are identified as one of three primary cohorts for higher quality reports on the day. However, I believe the pilot focuses on delivering written fast delivery reports for women produced on the same day, rather than full standard pre-sentence reports, which would enable more time for information to be sought in relation to children and the impact of a sentence on them. It will be true to say that some sentences request pre-sentence reports when sentencing a primary carer, but not all. And the point of this amendment is to ensure judges and magistrates have the full picture when sentencing. Let me come now to sentencing guidelines. Uh, these, provided by the Sentence Council to judges and magistrates, already do acknowledge the devastating impact of parental imprisonment. 
The noble lord, the minister said, and again I quote, courts are required by law to follow those guidelines. And the guidelines specify that being a sole or primary carer for dependent relatives is a mitigating factor when sentencing an offender. It's my understanding that being a sole or primary carer can be a mitigating factor, but it is up to the judge to decide whether or not they consider it as such. So it's left to the sentencer's discretion whether they consider it a factor which should change the sentence. Therefore, it cannot be said that the guidelines create an obligation on sentencers to consider dependent children. On the ground, there's evidence that these aren't always being consistently and robustly applied. Dr Shona Minson uh, has carried out research into the application of guidelines being applied in sentencing. She spoke with 20 Crown Court judges and asked, what kind of personal mitigation most often influences you in sentencing decisions? Half the judges interviewed thought of family dependence. Half the judges did not. So it seems judges do not take a consistent view on the relevance of dependence as a factor in mitigation. According to her research, Dr Minson suggests judicial understanding of the guidelines and case law which set out the duties of the court in relation to considering dependence in sentencing is limited and at times incorrect. At committee stage, the noble lord, the minister, said that the judiciary get it when it comes to sentencing mothers. I think this is an assertion that needs testing. In fact, we simply don't know the number of women in prison who are primary carers. So it's no more than speculation to say that judges are getting it on this issue. If the noble lord, the minister, is basing his assertion on the decline of numbers of women in prison, the latest annual prison population uh, projections explains that the recent decline in the number of women in prison was likely <coughs> driven by a drop in prosecutions and sentencing as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, with a lockdown affecting the mix of cases brought to courts and restrictions on the court's ability to process cases. Between 2013 and 2019, the women's prison population remained relatively consistent. Indeed, my lords, the fact that 500 new women's places are being built is not a sign that women's prison places are projected to fall. Finally, let me come to the importance of data. I was really encouraged, my lords, to read in the recently published white paper on prison strategy that the government intends to begin, and I quote, recording data on prisoners' family circumstances and caring responsibilities and conduct analysis to better understand the circumstances and needs of offenders, end of quote. I applaud and welcome this as a step in the right direction. Without data, we are making policy in the dark, and I'd welcome confirmation from the noble Lord, the Minister, of the timeline for this. <laughs> Amendment 105 in this group asks that this data might be collected at sentencing, disaggregated by gender, ethnicity, sentence and offender type, and publicly available. And I'd really welcome further discussions with the noble Minister to ensure that we're collecting the right type of information. My Lords, in conclusion, as a Christian, I believe each precious and unique child is made in the image of God and must be treated with dignity and respect. I know from the work of charities like Children Seen and Heard, the devastating impact losing a parent to prison can have on a child of any age. Research from Prison Reform Trust found children with a parent in prison felt invisible. My Lords, we must consider the rights of children to a family life. At the heart of these amendments is not a plea <laughs> never to send a mother or indeed a father to prison. Instead, I hope we might work towards preventing long-term harm for these children whose parents have done wrong, but for whom a community penalty is more appropriate for both the offender and the children. I look forward to hearing uh, what the Minister has to say. I'll be listen, listening carefully. But at this point, I just want to flag that I am minded to test the mind of the House on Amendment 85.